I'd like to know about your, uh, uh, there's so much you have to know about farming and things that are coming along new. What is your most consistently reliable source of information that you use to help you make your decisions? Uh, I think my dad always taught me, read as much as you can. doesn't matter if it's uh, farming magazines or, you know, Western producers, just certain articles. If you're just reading as much information as possible, that's, that's probably the best way to keep a, a tab on, on what's going on in the business and uh, what you should be looking towards in the future. Uh, your advisors as well. Um, I think especially my agrologist, uh, whether it's bugs or weeds or, you know, that type of thing is, is, is crucial as well. Uh, Dave's helped me out with uh, what, what kind of crops to grow, maybe limiting down to, instead of growing seven crops, growing three crops, the most profitable ones, that, that type of thing. So, as like I said before, it's the people you surround yourself with are, are important, and uh, I, I still say the most important thing is, is that you're reading the most up-to-date information from uh, farm magazines, for myself anyways. Well, I can't believe I'm going to tell you guys this. And for you, buddy, this should never leave the room. <laughs> of course, I rely on a lot of people and I do a lot of reading, but you know, the, my number one source of information is the manager of my local Viterra Ag Retail. And I'm as stunned as you probably are to actually say that. But I should back up a bit and tell you that, that there's a, that he's that there's this person who's been there probably to over 20 years, as far as I know, never did had a post-secondary education. Um, but I talked to you a little bit earlier about you know people can really uh, farmers can really smell when they're being snowed. This is a gentleman that's told me when his price was higher than someone else's to you know geez you better go phone over there because we're eight bucks a ton or twenty bucks a ton or whatever higher. What I'm trying to say is, I know when he gives me his information, it's the best information he can give me. And he, to the point where he looks out for my farm operation more than he looks out for his companies. And I don't think that's short-sighted of him because he knows that maybe he's uh, cost his company a few dollars today, but because I know that, I'll be back at his door tomorrow. I'm a firm believer of networking. You, you cannot know enough people in the industry and related industries in order to gather information. You can decide whether it's good information or not, but meeting people, I mean, we, we use a combination of things. And we use the, the magazines, the TV, uh, the Internet, um, but to get solid information actually is probably from other people. And whether it be my brothers, my my dad was was the first example is that he knew a lot of people when we were kids. And he'd run into people and we'd have to sit there and sort of stand there for till they had their talk. But you know what? That taught us something because my kids say the same thing to me. You can't walk down the street without running into somebody you know. I said, yeah, that's probably true. But it's about networking because then you know the credible people that you work with and you deal with and that you associate with, and you know you're getting really good information, enough that will give you a basis to do more research and look at it and whether or not it fits your operation because that's what it has to do. It has to fit your operation. But you can't know enough people in, in whatever industry that you're working in because of the fact that that personalized uh, source of two-way communication is the best. I mean, you can't text. You can sit and have that two-way communication a lot better than texting as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, I'm a professional agrologist and I, I would like to ask you a question that uh, interesting, interestingly enough it shifts towards psychology and if I could just set the, the scene for a moment. I've um, run my own consulting business and what I found pretty quickly was at that time I was saying well I need about fifty dollars an hour you know the farmers that I wanted to work with 
couldn't handle that because they were thinking in terms of $10 an hour to run whatever kind of equipment, if it's worth a half million dollars, 10 bucks an hour to drive it. They couldn't handle $50. But when I switched to acres, price per acre, I might be making 300 an hour, but they were as happy as could be. So um, in view of that, um, just to set the scene here, um, and uh, a well-paid, not, not well-paid, an ordinary job that isn't really well-paid in the city or even in the country, your teachers. $50,000 isn't really good anymore. Um, but uh, it would probably seem like a lot of money to be putting in your pocket to, to a lot of farmers. But if you're not going to pay according to the scales that are out there for other jobs, um, how could a person expect somebody to come to work for you, be a full-time employee year-round, and be really valuable and reliable and stay? So just with that psychological thing, we've got this uh, um, hired help or hired man terminology and mentality, and it's paid, not paid very highly. Well, the person couldn't get paid more than me. Um, how would you feel about... Uh, paying a really good permanent employee more than you're taking home. That would be a pretty tough one to swallow, I guess. Um, it's, that's a pretty, I agree with you too, like it's, my agrologist, same thing, it's paid by, you know, it's so many dollars per acre and, you know, it's one of those things you just, you work it in and I know exactly what you're saying. Um, I'm penciling certain things out, I, I, I pencil about my labor as a per acre cost. I know what my employee makes throughout the year and, and, uh, but you, know, I, you don't think you'd actually break it down to a certain dollars per acre is what he's going to get at the end of the day. One of the ways I've, I've thought of actually uh, working a, with my one hired man is, is the, the, more the, the more money the farm makes, the more money he makes. He, he's going to get a set, uh, set wage per hour, but at the end of the year when the financial records come back and the farm made X amount of dollars, he'll take home that uh, certain percentage of that uh, net income, and uh, basically that helps him work towards, you know, he's, he's going to be more willing to put those 16-hour days in on the combine or on the sprayer or the seeder if he knows at the end of the day that that's going to make him more money as well. So I think that's one of the, one of the ways I'm really kind of shifting my, my thoughts is, is and, and he might make more money, well, I guess in that scenario he wouldn't because his bonus would be, you know, as I make more money, he makes more money too, so... I think that's one of the best ways that I can, you know, promote my farm to come work for me, maybe ahead of some, other, some of the other farmers. As I understood your question, sir, it was basically to do with farm labor, not as, uh, as an agrologist consulting or anything like that. So that's how I'll answer your question. And I've got to say that actually I wouldn't have a problem with that. He might make more money than me this year um, if he, he hasn't captured any of the... Uh, increased value of my farm. I've done all that. And, uh, and I must say honestly that over the years uh, I've learned how to live on not a whole heck of a lot of money actually, so it's, it's not a big, it wouldn't be a big problem. Um, but we, we've either got to approach this, uh, I think, two ways. Either, yeah, you've got to pay somebody big bucks up front and just deal with that or else uh, the other business model uh, that you could maybe employ, and, and, and that happens a lot more when you're bringing your family in, is give them a piece of the pie. And that's really tough to do um, uh, psychologically. It's not so hard to do in an incorporated farm is to say, you know, you work with me and, and you can buy some shares and you can actually own some of this. Really tough to do um, in any case and, and doubly tough if, it, if it's not a family member. Tough question. Compensation, right? You're looking at a compensation package, right? So how do you work a new compensation package? You have to get over the idea of what the value of that person is. So you've got to look at not only, and that's what I talked earlier about, is that you have to have a mind change as to how you're treating your labor. Not only outside third-party labor, non-arms-length non -arms labor, but arms-length labor as well within your organization. 
So it's developing that uh, compensation package, which could be as in lots of industries. Their private industries have a, have a bonus payout based on their year-end results. Uh, you need to be in a position that you write, actually write a formal um, job description so that everybody understands and a formal contract. Um, handshakes are probably come becoming a thing of the past, that you have a performance review, uh, and at that point in time you have a, have a status of, uh, of scale as to, as to um, uh, above expectations, expectations, below expectations type of categories, so that uh, it becomes part of your overall review at the end of the year. So it's, it's a mind change. And it's been a difficult mind change over the last 10 years in agriculture because the number of farms and farmers are, uh, farms are going down, age is going up. So how do you get new, new entrants in? And that's one of the things you have to really be concerned about is that how do you pay them to be in that field because there's lots of competition for their services in today's economy.